today on The Truth in Crisis. No one seems to get it that somehow or other the church is dying off. The church is dying off. Well, what caused it? Well, you're pointing to it's because they changed the Mass. It's because they changed the ceremonies of the Mass or the rites of the Mass. Uh, Our Lady warned against making changes in the Mass, changing the, the liturgy of the Mass. And she spoke of uh, an evil council that would, uh, she predicted would take place in the church. And the removal of the traditional offertory prayers that stress the sacrificial nature of the Mass and their replacement with new prayers that are a kind of table blessing of the gifts. These changes in the liturgy and many others are all of Protestant origin. Hello, my name is Don Pinnell, and welcome to The Truth in Crisis. This is the first program in our two-part series entitled, Altering the Faith. Father Paul Kramer, noted author and lecturer, recently released his book titled, The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy. Father Nicholas Gruner will discuss with Father Kramer how the contents of his book are relevant to the current crisis in the Church. In 1969, Pope Paul introduced a new rite of Mass for the Latin Church that gave the appearance of binding all Catholics, priests, bishops, religious, and lay people. From 1969 to the present, it has been widely believed that priests are forbidden to say the old rite of the Latin Mass, commonly referred to as the Tridentine Mass. The introduction of this new rite caused widespread confusion, division, and disillusionment throughout large portions of the Church. Hundreds of churches across North America have been closed, even sold off and more than half the Catholics in North America have stopped going to Mass altogether since the new rite of Mass was imposed. Cardinal Bocelli, before he became Pope Pius XII, speaking about the message of Fatima, seemed to predict the confusion and division within the Church. He said, I am worried by the Blessed Virgin's message to Lucia Fatima. This persistence of Mary about the dangers which menace the Church is a divine warning against the suicide of altering the faith in her liturgy, her theology, and her soul. He went on to say, A day will come when the civilized world will deny its God, when the church will doubt as Peter doubted. She will be tempted to believe that man has become God. In our churches, Christians will search in vain for the red lamp where God awaits them. Like Mary Magdalene weeping before the empty tomb, they will ask, Where have they taken him? These striking words of the future Pope are grounds for belief that the present crisis of faith and even the changes in the Mass are predicted in the secret of Fatima. A new book by Father Paul Kramer, entitled The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy, talks about the changes in the Mass and emphasizes the Catholic's duty to embrace the true Catholic liturgical tradition as outlined in the Catholic Profession of Faith. I would now like to welcome Father Nicholas Gruner and Father Paul Kramer. We have here a very special guest and a very special book written by our special guest. The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy. And there's what it looks like. And Father Kramer, welcome to the program. It's good to be here, Father. And now, tell us, you can tell us uh, where the title came from and what the book is about. The title actually came from uh, a discourse of uh, Cardinal Pacelli before he had been elected Pope Pius XII. He was uh, speaking, uh, referring specifically to the message of uh, Our Lady of Fatima, the message having been given to uh, uh, Lucy of Fatima. And, and there he spoke of the suicide of altering the faith in a liturgy. Uh, and this book uh, is, is, uh, deals professedly on this topic, which is it, is it is an ecclesial suicide to alter the faith by altering the liturgy. So, and first of all, just to, to mention the fact that Pope Pius XII, before he was elected, uh, said that Our Lady of Fatima was warning the church to not commit the suicide of altering the faith in liturgy. I said other things besides that, but this is, and Cardinal Pacelli is reported in the, saying this in the book about him by Monsignor Roach. Now, Monsignor Roach is a, was a good friend and secretary to Cardinal uh, Tisserand, and Monsignor Roach wrote this book 
Pope Pius XII or Pius XII before the bar of history. And in his mouth, Pius XII is saying that the message of Fatima warns us against the suicide of all the faith liturgy. And so, uh, from what I gather, this book is saying, well, we've, they didn't listen to our Lady of Fatima, and the church is in the process of committing this act of suicide by, in fact, altering the faith and liturgy. Is that, is that what your thesis is? Yes, actually, I, uh, I wrote the book before I had learned uh, from two sources very close to uh, the present uh, Pope, uh, Benedict XVI, that while he was still a cardinal, he had revealed that the third secret, uh, among other things, uh, Our Lady warned against making changes in the Mass, changing the, the liturgy of the Mass. And she spoke of uh, an evil council that would, uh, she predicted would take place in the church. So Pope Pius XII, uh, even before he was elected Pope, he had gained knowledge of the, of the message of Fatima and of the secret. Uh, there was something about threatening the faith, to change the faith, to subvert the faith by changing the liturgy. And uh, this ties in, of course, with what Cardinal, uh, Cardinal, his name will come to, Mario Chappi says that the, that the great apostasy in the church begins at the top. So this points to the council, this points to uh, bringing the new mass in. And but this bringing the new mass in is, from what I gather from your title and from what Pope Pius XII was saying, is an act of suicide. Suicide means to kill oneself. The act of suicide is to inflict a mortal wound on oneself. Well, to suicide, it's presumably the suicide of the church by inflicting this mortal wound on itself by changing the faith in the liturgy, by changing the liturgy. Is that, is that what the book is about? Yes. Uh, Pope Paul VI uh, was the one who published the new missal and authorized the promulgation by the Sacred Congregation for Divine Worship to, to promulgate uh, the new liturgy to be, uh, to be used in the, in, the, in the Roman rite of the church, in the Roman patriarchate. And it was the same pope who, uh, who did not see the connection. He, he spoke of the church uh, as if it were committing uh, a, a auto-destruction, self-destruction. Yes. And in, in fact, this book explains doctrinally and theologically why uh, that will take place. It is the inevitable consequence that by changing the liturgy, uh, it is a suicidal act for the church. The dogma of the faith does not allow the changing of the liturgy because the law of God is clearly set forth in the infallible teaching of the church that the Catholic conscience is bound forever to the traditional rites, which is called the, the received and approved rites customarily used in the solemn administration of the sacraments. So now, it's, from what we can see around us, certainly that, that churches in various cities, certainly we can talk of Detroit, of Buffalo, and other, Boston and other places, I mean, almost every diocese has uh, the diocese selling off churches. Uh, what is more dramatic than if people that, that, and people moving into the church and staying there, and they remember their fathers and their grandfathers and their great grandfathers contributing for the building of these churches. And now we see these churches being sold, and apparently no one seems to get it that somehow or other the church is dying off. The church is dying off. Well, what caused it? Well, you're pointing to because they changed the Mass, because they changed the ceremonies of the Mass, or the rites of the Mass. Uh, and you're telling them in this book there's a direct connection, A, theologically and, uh, and pastorally, but also, it's also said by Our Lady Fatima in the secret that this is what would happen. So whether they take it from the voice of prophecy, whether they take it from the voice of theology, it's the same message. The church is committing suicide by having the new mass. Is that, is that what you're basically saying? Yes, it was. It was something very predictable. I remember uh, uh, hearing about this uh, seminary building that was constructed in Buffalo uh, shortly after the council, and uh, I think it was by 1970 they were talking about uh, selling it because there, there was the place was empty, it was not being used. It was something very predictable. Uh, at, at the, around the time of the council, they were predicting the seminaries are going to be filled and they're going to be building more churches. The churches are going to be overflowing with faithful coming to Mass on Sunday. As soon as the new Mass was promulgated and, and it was being celebrated in the churches, suddenly people just stopped coming to church. And it's something very predictable. Why is it so predictable? Because the traditional liturgy of the Roman Church is an expression of the Catholic faith. It's, a, it's an expression of the religious sentiment of the people because it is the, 
It is the faith of the church over the centuries that built the, the, the received and approved rite of the liturgy. Whereas the new rite of Pope Paul VI is, is, a, is a liturgy that was concocted, artificially created by uh, a gang of bureaucrats. And so it did not express the piety and the faith of the people. And so it was something alien to the people. And when they, when they were confronted with this new reality, they, they decided they didn't want any part of it. Well, it's, it's like, I guess, uh, uh, I don't see anyone running out to buy uh, books of direction, how to, uh, I don't know, turn your mixmaster on or something like that. Uh, they go out and buy books that have some heart to it. In other words, it's stories or something else. Obviously, we need books of direction, how to make a machine run, but it's only technicians who deal with that kind of stuff. But the common people are not going to go reading you know, heartless books about how to turn a machine on. I mean, that's not their profession. I'm, I'm trying an analogy between that and a group of bureaucrats coming up with a quote-unquote liturgy that has no heart to it, as distinct from uh, people who have put their lives into uh, have, making the Mass what it was of, over the centuries. The pretext, of course, was that this is a disciplinary matter. And so th they would say that uh, Pope Pius V could not bind uh, the entire church forever uh, to one, ex one liturgical expression. But of course, this argument is false. The idea that one pope cannot bind a, a future pope would, would uh, apply to merely ecclesiastical law, merely disciplinary matters, and matters of discipline that can be revised. But we're not dealing with a merely disciplinary matter here. It's, it's, it's a matter of the faith. And I think that that's what you said. Actually, you were telling me before that you discovered this canon of uh, Session 7, Canon 13 of the Council of Trent, which said that it, no one can assert that a, a pastor of any rank whatsoever can, in fact, I impose a new rite of mass or new liturgy. Even that canon, of course, is presupposes uh, other doctrinal pronouncements. For example, we have the solemn profession of faith of Pope Pius IV, which is called the Tridentine Profession of Faith. And this profession was again repeated, uh, I believe, by the First Vatican Council almost, in almost precisely the same wording, where, where one professes adherence to the received and approved rites of the Church. That phrase, received, is repeated again and again, received and approved. It's not just an approved rite, but it's a received and approved rite. So we should explain what that phrase means, received and approved rite. To use the expression of Pope Pius V in his bull, Quo Primum, he spoke of the Roman rite of Mass. He said, this is the liturgy that has been handed down in the Roman Church. The, the liturgy that we have, as correspondingly in the Greek Church, and the, the Byzantine uh, rite, these liturgical rites evolved, they developed out of the apostolic traditions because they are rooted in, they grew out of the apostolic tra traditions. They are directly rooted in the apostolic traditions, and therefore it is these liturgies that are sanctioned by divine law. So the official liturgy of the Roman Church can only be the Roman, the Roman rite, according to Catholic dogma, just as the official liturgy of the Byzantine Church is the Byzantine rite. No pope, no authority on earth has the right or the authority to abolish those, to suppress those, and replace them with new rites, because it is, it is of divine and Catholic faith. So we, we are bound forever to the received and approved right handed down respectively in our ritual church. So the received means if you give me this book, I receive it. But if you give it to me, you hand it on to me. So it's but the right that was handed on or that we have received from our forefathers, coming from Christ, coming from the apostles, handed down through the centuries down to, this, down to us today. That is the received, I'm the receiver, they're the ones who handed on to me from before. It's the other end of... That's right. As uh, as uh, Saint Athanasius used the formula, handed down from father to father, yes. because uh, it is it is this handing the handing on of tradition. Of course, the act of tradition, the handing on from generation to generation, establishes the custom, and that's why we have that phrase in the Council of Trent, session seven, canon thirteen refers refers to the. The received and approved rites customarily used in the solemn administration of the sacraments. Now, this has often been misinterpreted because some people will say, 
oh, what this means is that no one has the right to change or alter the rights except for the Pope, because only the Pope would have that authority. But the, but the canon is not referring to, and this is a dogmatic canon with an anathema. So we're talking about the church not making a law, but the church declaring a proposition to be heretical. And properly that, that proposition is that if anyone says that the received and approved right customarily used in the solemn administration of the sacraments can be changed into other new rights, let him be anathema. So the very idea that the rights can be changed by anyone is declared to be heresy. It's declared to be anathema. Now, some people might challenge me on this point and say, well, that's not the correct interpretation of the canon. But again, if you look in, in canon law, custom is the best interpreter of the law. And in fact, custom is the best interpreter uh, of the mind of the church in its dogmatic teachings. How has the church understood these things down through the centuries? And that's how we must interpret them. In the solemn oath of coronation, for 600 years, the popes solemnly professed that they did not have the right, they did not have the authority to change the right and the discipline of the church. Now, Pope St. Damasus explains that modifications can be made, minor modifications can be made in the discipline of the church. Uh, Pope Leo XIII in Orientalium Dignitas explains that there are minor modifications that can be made in the liturgy, mainly in the nature of a restoration. Paul Pius XI uh, explains that it is the duty of the Pope to preserve the liturgy and safeguard it from adulter adulteration because the received and approved right has divine sanction. It is the official liturgy of the Church and therefore the Pope does not have the authority to change the liturgy but by divine institution, it is a pope's duty to preserve the liturgy from adulteration, from being changed. But on that very point, in fact, that canon that we cited earlier, canon uh, 13 of section 7 says, if anyone says that a pastor of any rank whatsoever, well, the pope is also a pastor. He's a rank of a pastor, and so even the pope is forbidden from doing this. And that's right in the, the dogmatic definitions, I recall. That's right. And for 600 years, the popes professed that they did not have the authority. And they invoked the wrath of, the, of God upon themselves if they should dare to change the rights of the church. Well, it just brings me to another uh, curse, so to speak, that's in the Quo Primum. And certainly this book is, you only put Quo Primum as one of your auxiliary arguments after the whole book was written because what well, canon has told you you should do it, but it's not dependent on Quo Primum. But I want to mention here, because we're running out of time on this program, we have to talk again, Father, is that in Quo Primum, that God, the Pope calls down the wrath of Almighty God and of St. Peter and Paul if someone should uh, ever uh, interfere with, with, the, uh, the, the, with Quo Primum. With the, and, and, for example, in there he says, no pastor can stop a priest from saying that the traditional Mass not even a cardinal, not a religious superior, not a bishop. Nobody can do that because it's right in the, the, the papal decree. That's right. Well, Pope Pius V uh, was very sure of himself when he did that because popes from the time of St. Agatho up until uh, St. Peter Celestine, Pope Celestine V, solemnly professed uh, that they did not have the authority to, to change the rights of the church and they invoked the wrath of God upon themselves. If they, if they should change the rights or if they should dare let anyone change them. Yes, so uh, this book then is about the uh, reversing the act of suicide being committed for the last 40 years or 35 years in the church. And this is based on the theology, on the dogmatic theology of why the uh, act of Paul VI uh, suppressing de facto uh, the old mass and, uh, and bringing in the new mass was, was something that... Was I've explained doctrinally, the, and that's why I have so many footnotes here, doctrinally, that the liturgy cannot be changed. The Church's infallible teaching binds us forever to the received and approved rite, which in the Roman Church is the Roman rite codified by Pope St. Pius V. Yes. We'll have to talk some more on, on this program with Father about his great new book, and we'll, we'll uh, talk, hope to interview him soon. Thank you for being with us today, Father. The suicide of altering the faith should be read, re-read, and thoroughly understood by anyone professing to be a Roman Catholic. No one can afford to be ignorant of the issues presented with such clarity and scholarship in this long-awaited work. 
Is the tradition of the church, including her immemorial liturgy, just one of many options which a Catholic in our day and age is free to choose from? Some will find this book an informative confirmation of what they already believe and practice. Others will find it a means to discover and accept the inescapable truth that its flawless logic will lead them to. Still others will brush off the compelling message of this work and continue to fiddle while Rome burns. Pray, read, learn. Father Kramer's work is excellent. He gives a complete and convincing argument explaining a major cause of the current crisis in the church today as only a theologian of his high caliber could. His insights into the mind of the church regarding her law and her liturgy are clear and absolutely penetrating. His candidness in explaining why the hierarchy still fails to do anything about the current situation leads to the logical and inevitable conclusion that they condemn themselves. To receive a copy of The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy, order online at www.fatimashop.org or call toll-free 1-888-FATIMA-1. That is 1-888-3284621. We now join John Fonari for his unique perspective. Father Kramer's book, The Suicide of Altering the Faith in the Liturgy, is one of the most important books published on the Mass since the Council. Father Kramer's unique contribution is that he stresses that it is of divine and Catholic faith that the Catholic is obliged to adhere to the received and approved rites customarily used in the solemn administration of the sacraments. In other words, for those in the Roman Rite, the Catholic is obliged to adhere to the Latin Tridentine Mass, the Mass of all time, the Mass that made saints throughout the centuries. The new Mass, instituted in 1969, is not an expression of the Catholic faith. Even Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became Pope, he referred to the new Mass as a banal on-the-spot fabrication. The purpose of the new Mass was not to express the Catholic faith as it had been taught and practiced throughout the centuries, but to satisfy the demands of a new ecumenism with non-Catholic religions. Archbishop Annibale Bunini, the architect of the new Mass, admitted this openly in the Observatorio Romano in March of 1965. He said, we must strip from our Catholic prayers and from the Catholic liturgy everything that can be the shadow of a stumbling block for our separated brethren, that is, for the Protestants." Close quote. Catholic author Michael Davies, as have other writers, demonstrated repeatedly that the new Mass, written with the help of six Protestant ministers, was a Protestant construct and that the elements of the new liturgy mirrored those elements incorporated by the original Protestants of the 16th century. For example, the celebrant facing the people, uh, the entire liturgy said in the vernacular instead of Latin, and the removal of the traditional offertory prayers that stress the sacrificial nature of the Mass and their replacement with new prayers that are a kind of table blessing of the gifts. These changes in the liturgy, and many others, are all of Protestant origin. In fact, in 1969, just before Paul VI released the new liturgy, Vatican Cardinals Ottaviani and Bacci sent Paul VI a letter that accompanied a famous critical study of the new Mass by a group of Roman theologians. And here the cardinals warn that the new Mass, and this is a quote, represents both as a whole and in its details a striking departure from the Catholic theology of the Mass as it was formulated in session 22 of the Council of Trent, and that this new Mass would produce, and this is quoting them again, an agonizing crisis, an agonizing crisis of conscience for numerous priests, which it did. The critical study also said that the new Mass would gladden the heart of the most modernist Protestant. The new Mass is not truly a Catholic liturgy, but an ecumenical one. It was designed to accommodate those who do not accept the most basic tenets of the Catholic faith, such as the sacrifice of the Mass, the sacrifice in Catholic priesthood, and the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And this is why thousands of Catholics around the world have rejected the new Mass and will worship only within the old Latin Mass, which is the true expression of Catholic worship 
a mass that was not concocted by a committee of liberals, by, but a mass that grew out of the Catholic devotion of the centuries. And the more Catholics know about the true nature of both the old mass and the new mass, the sooner will be fulfilled the admonition of the renowned liturgist Monsignor Klaus Gamber. He was a liturgist publicly praised by Cardinal Ratzinger before he became Pope. And Gamber wrote in 1993, he said, in the final analysis, in the future, the traditional rite of Mass must be retained in the Roman Church as the primary liturgical form for the celebration of Mass. It must become, once more, the norm of our faith and the symbol of Catholic unity throughout the world, a rock of stability in a period of upheaval and never-ending change. Father Kramer's new book explains a good deal on how the new Mass came about, the problems with this new liturgy, and why the Catholics should resist it and adhere exclusively to the traditional Latin Mass of all time. I'm John Veneri. The Secret Still Hidden, written by attorney and Catholic commentator Christopher A. Ferrara, conducts a meticulous examination of a mass of evidence including many recent disclosures and inconsistencies on the part of the Vatican Secretary of State, and demonstrates beyond doubt that a text of the Third Secret has been suppressed. Given the absolute urgency of the secret for every inhabitant of the planet, this book calls upon the Vatican to reveal the hidden words of the Virgin to the whole world before it is too late. Order your copy now. Call toll-free 1-888-FADMA-1. That's one 888 328-4621 or online at www.secretstillhidden.com Thank you for joining us today. Please watch us next week as we conclude our two-part series on the suicide of altering the faith. For The Truth in Crisis, I'm Don Pinnell. Keep current on the events that surround the world in the Fatima message. Call one 888 Fatima One for your issue of the Fatima Crusader, the largest publication on Our Lady's urgent message. Receive your free copy of this quarterly publication by calling 1-888-FATIMA-1. Call now. For an in-depth look at the Fatima message, log on to the Fatima Network website at www.fatima.org. Our Lady of Fatima said, If my requests are granted, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If my requests are not granted, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, raising up wars and persecutions against the Church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer. Various nations will be annihilated. For more information, please call us at our toll-free number 1-888-FADMA-1. That's 1-888-328-4621. You can also find out more on our website, www.fadma.org.